So the companion to showing amounts is showing proportions. Um, proportions are just mathematically transformed versions of amounts. Um, and they're useful because sometimes we want to show um, values um, in a more standardized way. We want to compare values across a whole population. So if you're trying to compare um, like the size of government of like Tuvalu versus the size of government of China, um, they're going to be wildly different because China just has like a billion people in it. Um, and so you'd want to compare proportions, like what proportion of the country of the population of those two countries works for the public sector, for, for instance, and that's more comparable. Um, and so in that case, you don't want to work with raw count numbers, you want to scale it down. So it's in in terms of proportion instead. Um, and that's a good thing to do. Um, it's also it's good to do this whenever it makes analytical sense, um, you want to look at at per capita things if you're trying to compare wildly different countries. This is why we use GDP per capita so often in like economics and political science, because that again scales it down to um, to more population based um, estimates instead of the raw estimates. Um, in your readings, though, I had you look at a few tweets uh, from the the graphics director at the Financial Times. Um, the Financial Times during this pandemic has been publishing daily charts showing the trajectories of a whole bunch of different countries um, with the numbers of cases of COVID-19 and, and the number of deaths from COVID-19. Um, you've hopefully seen all of these charts even before um, you looked at those tweets for this class. Um, and so you can see that all these countries are going up and it talks about flattening the curve. Um, this is kind of the whole reasoning behind flattening the curve because you don't want countries to keep going up and up and up infinitely. That's bad. Um, so one common thing that's been happening, um, at least in my social circles on Facebook and Twitter, is that people who are more anti-lockdown um, and anti-quarantine have been calling for um, showing these numbers by per capita. Don't just show the raw numbers. We need to scale it down for, um, for exact country sizes. And so you can't compare Denmark with the United States um, because we have way more people in the United States. So our per capita levels of infections are actually way lower than anywhere else in Europe. Um, and I've even seen some friends of mine on Facebook say that if you don't scale it um, to per capita numbers, you're lying with statistics and you're, you're creating fake news. Um, which is not actually the case. As you saw with the Financial Times um, data reporter's video, um, there are good valid epidemiological reasons for not showing per capita numbers with those COVID-19 numbers. Um, it's because um, viruses don't work on a per capita basis. Um, the virus won't grow faster in the United States in its initial phase um, because it knows there are more people and it won't grow slower in Denmark because it knows there are fewer people. Um, it's going to keep growing at a constant rate with um, whatever the population is. Um, and so showing kind of the rate of growth and showing how big it's getting, even if it's a small outbreak. In, so in the United States, it started off being small outbreaks in Washington and New York City, um, but that was still bad. Um, because then it kept growing and growing and growing and now we have kind of the greatest number of cases and the greater, greatest number of deaths in the world um, and now our per capita numbers aren't great they were in the initial days but the virus still spreads regardless of of, of showing per capita numbers or not um, it's just that when you scale stuff down with the per capita numbers you're going to hide kind of the underlying infections which is a problem um, and so if it makes sense to not show something as proportional, um, then don't do it. Um, like with these these COVID numbers that we're seeing, um, the Financial Times was wise to not um, show per capita numbers. Other organizations have um, sometimes caving to um, public outcry that they need to to bring down the numbers. But as you saw in the video that the Financial Times guy posted, um, it's the same numbers. It's just scaling it down and making it look better than it actually is. Um, which isn't great if you're trying to set policy because then it's going to be too optimistic. Um, so a, the most common way to show proportions um, is to use pie charts. And this is because Excel makes it super easy to show pie charts. And it's because when you're looking at something that's proportional, you're generally talking about parts of a whole. And so pies are like complete circles and everything fits in the circle. And so it, it kind of makes sense conceptually um, to show proportions of a whole circle. 
Um, the issue with this, though, as we've been saying throughout this session, is that we can't perceive angles and fill spaces and fill areas very well compared to lines. And so it makes it really hard to distinguish between categories um, and really close angles that are, that are too similar. So there are, in, there are situations where it's OK to use pie charts, kind of. Um, the general guideline here is only use them if there are a few distinguishable categories and the differences between them are huge. And so it's really easy to tell the difference. Um, if there are way too many categories and if they are too close to each other in value, then it's not going to be interpretable. So if you look at these two examples here, this first pie chart is an example of a good pie chart. Um, it has three categories, so you can easily find them. And this slice is way smaller than that slice, which is way smaller than the giant slice. And so you, there you can tell there are big differences between the groups. Here, each of these slices is a different value. They're all kind of around 18 to 22 ish. Um, but good luck figuring out which ones are the biggest and which ones are the smallest. Um, I can't tell. I can't remember what they are. Um, it's impossible to tell. So don't do pie charts when it has this many um, categories in it. It's not going to work. Um, and even if you have something like this, a bar chart would still show the differences in magnitude between these, these different levels here more than this pie chart would. So generally avoid pie charts. If you absolutely have to make one because um, your manager says it must be done, then do it, but also tell them it's bad. So try to avoid them. There are lots of alternatives to pie charts. In general, pretty much all of the stuff that we talked about with amounts applies to proportions. Um, so you can use bar charts to show percentages. Um, you can show lollipop charts, you can show heat maps, you can show waffle plots, you can show any of those things that we talked about for proportions. So experiment with those instead of a pie chart. Um, there are also things called tree maps and mosaic plots. And these are popular when you're working with categorical variables um, that are just different um, categories, like um, two different survey responses. Like if you want to see if Republicans, independents, or Democrats strongly agree, slightly agree, disagree, like a, a Likert scale, um, you're not going to have like actual numbers. You're just going to have counts of Democrats that agree, counts of Republicans that disagree, etc. Um, and so one way of showing that visually is with these mosaic plots. Um, you've probably seen these in the real world sometimes. Um, they're like fancy square pie charts, basically. Um, where instead of having slices, you have giant rectangles, and then they're cut up into the sizes of the rectangles that are proportional to the thing that you're showing. So this is the Human Development Index, which is a, a scale that the, the World Bank creates that shows how developed a country is um, from zero to one. And so here you can see like North America is a big chunk of the world. Europe is a big chunk of the world. They have kind of the highest HDI. Um, Asia has a much smaller HDI. Um, you can see kind of these main countries sized by how big their human development index is, which is neat. Like this looks cool and infographic-y, but if you're trying to like actually interpret these things, it's really hard to tell. Um, and so these can be confusing. You can also use mosaic plots, um, which are kind of the same idea um, where you have columns along the x-axis that are uh, sized according like their width is sized according to how many responses there were that said somewhat rude to recline or not rude to recline in a in an airplane seat um, and then on the y-axis they're also sized by the amount of people who responded and so here you can see that people who think that is somewhat rude to recline um, will will once in a while recline uh, they themselves will once in a while recline. So these are, again, hard to read because you have to look at like this cell is the people who think that it's rude to recline, but always recline, um, which is an interesting finding. These people hate the fact that um, like they think it's really bad to recline in your airplane seat, but they'll always do it. So you can see those proportions. But again, that's it's hard to tell the difference in these sizes here. It's hard to um, immediately understand what's going on in this graph. And so that that's kind of tricky to do. So be careful with these. They're popular, they're infographic-y, but they're also hard to work with. Um, and there are these, um, if you click on these links, it'll take you to the R packages that make these things um, and show you all sorts of code, code examples for making them. Um, another alternative is to use specialized figures for the thing that you're actually trying to show the proportions of. 
Um, so one of these is something called a parliament plot. Um, and you may have seen these in like um, CNN reports or things like that, um, where it will have kind of the shape of the Senate or the shape of the House of Representatives and then color them by seats. And so here you can see that 46% 46, 46 of the Senate was um, Democratic, 52% was um, Republican. And so they were in power. I think this is from 2012 or 2014 or something. Um, and so this shows, um, an, like along with this bar here, it shows that the Republicans had control of the Senate at this point in history. Um, this is essentially a pie chart, just half of a pie chart. Um, but the fact that it is um, shaped like this matches the, the shape of the Senate chambers. Um, each of these dots represents a seat, and so it's, it's kind of a better encoding of the information. Um, you can also use GG Parliament here to make the shapes of other parliaments. And so this is the House of Parliament in the UK. They have a rectangular chamber with the opposition party and the in-power party. And so you can also map each of the seats to different political parties. Um, they've got a whole bunch of different shapes for other countries. You should check it out. It's cool. Um, but it's in this case, this is a more specialized way of looking at proportions. You could technically do this as a bar chart. You could do it as a pie chart if you wanted to do bad stuff. Um, but you can also use specialized packages like that. Um, so if you're trying to visualize specific data for the stuff you're interested in, it's helpful to just go to Google and search ggplot macroeconomic data or ggplot linguistics data or whatever you're looking at to see what other people have done. Um, it's really helpful to go to Google, search for whatever you're looking for, and then click on the images tab and scroll through and see the other plots people have made um, to kind of give you ideas of, of what's good, what's been out there, how you can improve stuff. Um, so that's my main recommendation here. So now you know all about amounts and proportions.